from San Mateo, California, it's theCUBE, covering SnapLogic Innovation Day 2018. Brought to you by SnapLogic. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are in San Mateo at, they call it the Crossroads. It's 92 and 101. If you're coming by, you're probably sitting in traffic. Look up, you'll see SnapLogic. It's their new offices. We're really excited to be here for Innovation Day. And we're excited to have the CTO, James Makarian. James, great to see you. And uh, I guess I, we last talked a couple years ago in yeah, New maybe York City. Yeah, that's right. And and what was uh, what, why was I there? It was like a big data, that's a big right. data show. And here we are again, two years later, talking about big data. Big data, <laughs> but big data, but big data is fading a little bit because now big data is really an engine that's powering this new thing that's so exciting, which is all about analytics and machine learning and and. We're going to eventually stop saying artificial intelligence and say augmented intelligence because there's really nothing artificial about it. Yeah, and we might stop saying big data and just talk about data it's because just data. it's becoming so uh, so ubiquitous. Right. And I don't know that big data is necessarily going away, but sort of how we're thinking about handling it has maybe like kind of evolved over over time, especially in the last couple of years. Right. At least that's what we're kind of seeing from our from our customers. This is kind of an ingredient now, right? It's no longer this new shiny object. Now it's just part of of the infrastructure that helps you get everything else done. Yeah, and I think when you think about it from like an enterprise point of view, that 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 shift is going from experimentation to operationalizing. And I think the things that you look for in experimentation, you know, there's like one set of things that you're looking for, proving out the overall value, regardless maybe of cost and uptime and other things. And then as you operationalize, you start thinking about other considerations that obviously like enterprise IT has to think about. Right. So if you think back to like Hadoop Summit and Hadoop World when those are yeah. first uh, cracking their teeth like in 2010, around that yeah. time frame, um, one of the big discussions that always comes up, and that was before kind of the rise of public cloud, you know, which has really taken off over the last several right. years, is this kind of ongoing debate between do you move the data to the to the compute or do you move the compute to the data? And there was always this like monster data gravity issue right. that was almost insurmountable and, and, and many would say, oh, you're never going to get all your data into the cloud. It's just way too hard and way yeah. too expensive. But you know, now Amazon has snowballs, and the snowball wasn't big enough. They actually had a diesel truck that'll come <laughs> and help you move your data. <laughs> Amazon, they rolled that thing across the stage a couple years ago. The data gravity thing seems to be less, and if, if you think of a world with infinite commute, or compute, infinite store, and infinite networking, asymptotically approaching zero, not necessarily good news for some vendors out there, but that's a mm -hmm. world that we're eventually getting to that changes the way that you organize all this stuff. Yeah, I think so So much has changed. And you know, I, I was fortunate to be one of the, like, the early speakers like uh, in like, these to-do you know, worlds and everything. And, and I was like, you know, adamantly proclaiming, you know, the destiny of Hadoop is like bright and shiny. And there's like this question about what really happened. And I think that there's a few, uh, kind of a few different variables that kind of shifted at the same time. One is, of course, this like glut of computing in the cloud happened. And like, and there were there's like so many variables moving at once. It's like, how, how much time do you have, Jeff? Let's we'll see. <laughs> so like, yeah, you know, like when I think Guys, about, we'll get a couple more drinks for. Yeah, you know, so you're seeing our lovely like new headquarters, right, right, you know, right. here. And like one of the things is, you know, we don't. There's like no big like data center. Yeah, you know, there's no. We have a like a little closet with some of the you know servers that we keep around. But mostly everything that we do is like on on Amazon. And you're even looking at things now like commercial real estate is changing because you know I don't need all the cooling and the power and the space for my data center that I once had. Right, right. And so like I'm a lot more space efficient than I than I used to be. And so like the cloud is really kind of changing everything. And on the data side, you know, you you mentioned this like interesting philosophical shift. You know, going from I couldn't possibly do it in the cloud to why in the world would we not do things in the cloud? And with like maybe the one stalwart in there being like some fears about security, obviously there's been a lot of breaches. Um, I think that there's still a lot of introspection everyone needs to do about, you know, is, is my on-premise, uh, are my on-premise systems actually more secure than some of these cloud providers? And it's really not clear um, that we know the answer to that. In fact, right. we suspect that some of the cloud providers are actually more secure because they're kind of like professionals about it and they have best practice. Um, and, and a whole lot of money. And the other thing that happened that you didn't mention like that's approaching infinity, we're not quite there yet, is interconnect speed. So it used to be the case, you know, I have a bunch of like, you know, mainframes and 
I have a Teradata system and I have a high-speed interconnect that you know, puts the two together. And now with uh, fiber networks and you know just in general, you can run like super high speed, like kind of WAN, you know WAN, especially if you don't care quite as much about latency. So if you, you know, if like 500 millisecond latency is still like okay with you, right? You can do a heck of a lot and move a lot to the cloud. In fact, it's like so good that we went from worrying, you know, could I could I do this in the cloud at all to well, why wouldn't I do some things in Amazon and some things in Microsoft and some things in Google, even if it meant replicating my data across all of these environments? And the backdrop for some of that is, sorry, uh, is um, we had a lot of customers, and like I was, th you know, thinking that people would approach it this way. They would install on-premise Hadoop, you know, you know, whether it's like Apache or Cloudera or the other vendors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would like hire a bunch of folks that are like the administrators, and I'm gonna like retire Teradata, and I'm gonna put all my ETL you know, jobs on on there, et cetera. And it turned out to be like a great theory, and the practice, you know, was real for some folks, but it turned out to be, you know, moving a lot of things to kind of shifting sands because Hadoop was evolving at the time uh, that a lot of you know customers were putting a lot of pressure on it operational pressure, again, moving from experimentation phase over to like operational right, phase. Right. And like when you don't have the uptime guarantee and when I can't just hire somebody off the street to administer this, it has to be a very sharp, you know, knowledgeable person, like that's very expensive. You know, people started saying, well, what am I really getting from this? And can't I just dump it all in S3 and apply like a bunch of technology there and let Amazon you know, worry about keeping this thing up and running, and people start saying, "You know, I used to, re you know, uh, I used to reject that idea. Now it's sounding like a very smart it's, idea." <laughs> it's so funny. We talk about people, process, and tech all the time, right? But they call them tech shows. They don't call them people and process shows, right? Well, it's not the ones we go to. But time and time again, and I remember talking to some people about the Hadoop situation. It's like there's just no Hadoop people. Mm -hmm. You talk about the technology all day long, there just aren't enough people with the skills to actually implement it. It's probably changed now, but I remember that was such a big yeah. a big problem. And, and it's funny, you talk about the security and, and cloud security. Um, you know, at AWS, I think on Tuesday night of reInvent, they have a special kind of a technical keynote. Used to be, uh, James Hamilton would go. And in the amount of resources, I mean, I just remember one talk he gave just on their cabling across the mm -hmm. ocean. You know, the amount of resources that he can bring to bear relative to any individual That's company right. is so different, much less a mid-tier company or a, a small company. I mean, you can bring so much more resources, expertise, knowledge. Yeah, the economies of scale are they're just, just there. They're just you know, crazy. That, that, that's right, and and that's why you know, like you you sort of assume that the you know the cloud sort of you know eventually eats eats everything. Right, right. right. And so I, there's no reason to believe this won't be one of those cases. So you guys are getting extreme. So what is yeah. Snap Logic Extreme? Well, Snap Logic Extreme is kind of a like a, a response to this trend of data moving from on premise to the cloud, and there are some like interesting dynamics of that movement. First of all, you need to get data into the cloud. You know, first of all, and we've been doing that doing that for years. Connect to everything, dump it in S3, ADLS, etc. No, like no no problem. Uh, the thing that we're seeing with cloud computing is like there's another interesting shift. Not only is it like kind of like mess for less, like let Amazon sort of like manage all this. And I, you know, I, I, I probably refer to Amazon more than like you know other vendors would appreciate. Right. But right. you know, like well, you know, let's, they're the leaders. So yeah, you know, yeah. call a spade a spade. <laughs> yeah, clearly so, uh, Google and and uh, Microsoft are out there as well. So those are the top three. We've acknowledged that. Yeah. So one of the one of the interesting <laughs> things about it is that you couldn't really adequately achieve on premises this burstiness of your compute. So you know, I run at a steady state where I need you know ten servers, hundred servers, but every once in a while I need like a thousand or like ten thousand servers right. to apply to something. So what's the on-premise model? Rack and stack ten thousand machines, and it's like you know waiting for the great pumpkin, like waiting waiting for that workload to come that I've been waiting like months and months for, and maybe it never comes, but I'm paying for it. Right. You know, I paid for a software license for the thing that I need to run there. I'm paying for like you know the cabling and the racking and everything and the person administering, make sure the the disks are all operating in the case you know where it gets used. Now all of a sudden like you know we're we're taking Amazon and they're saying hey you know pay us for what you're using. You can use 
you know, reserved pricing and, pr and pay like a lower rate for the things that you might actually care about uh, on a consistent basis. But then I'm gonna allow you to like spike and I'll just run the meter. Um, and so this has caused software vendors like us to look at the way that we you know, charge and the way that we deploy our resources and say, hey, that's a very good model. So we wanna follow that. And so we introduced uh, SnapLogic Extreme which has a few different components, but basically it enables us to operate in these elastic environments, uh, shift um, you know, our thinking and pricing so that we don't think about like node-based or God forbid, like core-based uh, pricing uh, and say like, hey, you know, basically pay us for what you, what you do with your data and don't worry about how many servers it's running on and let SnapLogic worry about spinning up and spinning down these machines because a lot of these workloads are you know, data integration or application workloads that we know lots about. Right. So, uh, first of all, we we manage these uh, ephemeral, what we call ephemeral uh, or elastic clusters. Second of all, the way that we distribute our workload is by generating Spark uh, code currently. So we use the same graphic environment that you use for everything, but instead of running on our engines, we kind of spit out Spark code on the end that takes advantage of the massive scale out potential for these uh, for these uh, ephemeral environments. Right. Then we've also kind of built this in such a way that it's Spark today. Uh, it could be like native, uh, or it could be some other engine like Flink or other things that come up, and we really don't care like what that backend engine actually is, as long as it can run certain types of data-oriented jobs. So it's like actually like lots of things in, in, in one. So we combine our kind of like data acquisition and distribution capability with this like massive elastic scale out capability. Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, unbelievable how you can spin that up and then of course most people forget you need to spin it down after the event. Yeah, that's right. Um, we talked to a, a great uh, vendor who talked about, you know, my customer spends no money with me on the weekend. Uh -huh. Zero. Right. And I'm thrilled because they're right. not using me. But when they do use me, then, then they're buying stuff. And I think what's really interesting is how that changes also your relationship with your customer. If you have a recurring revenue model, you have to continue to deliver value. You have to stay close to your customer. You have to stay engaged because it's not a one-time pop and then you send them the 15% or 20% maintenance bill. It's really kind of this ongoing relationship and they're actually getting value from your products each and every time they use it, very different way. Yeah, that's right. I, I think it creates better relationships because you feel like you know what we do is in proportionate to what they do, and like and vice versa. Right. So it has this kind of like fundamental fairness uh, about it, if if, if you will. Right. <laughs> it's a good relationship. But I want to go down another path. Yeah. Before you turn the cameras on, um, <laughs> talk a little bit about kind of the race always between you know, the, the need for compute and the compute. And it used to be personified best with Microsoft and Intel. Intel would come out with a new chip and then Microsoft OS would eat up all the extra capacity right. and they come up with a new chip and it was an ongoing thing. You made an interesting comment that, especially in a cloud world where the scale of these things is much, much bigger, that we're in a world now where the compute and the, and the storage have kind of outpaced the applications, right. if you will. And there's an, there's an opportunity for the applications to catch up Oh, by the way, we have this new cool thing called machine learning right. and augmented intelligence. So, what if you can, you know, is that is that what's going to fill, yeah, the yeah. kind of rebalance the, uh, yeah, the see, consumption it, it, pattern? It seems you think? that way, and I always think about like kind of like you know, compute and software spiraling around each other like a helix, and like at one point one is leading the other, and they sort of just one eventually surpasses the other and then you need innovation on the other side. And I think for a while, like if you turn the clock like way back to like, you know, when the Pentium was like, you know, in introduced yes. and everyone was like, how are we ever going to use all of the Windows compute 95. power, you know, power of the like Pentium? Like, you know, do I really need to run my spreadsheets like 100% faster? Like right. there's no business value whatsoever in transacting faster or in like general user interface, like you know, graphical user interfaces or rendering web pages. But then, so then you start seeing like this new, you know, glut, you know, often led by like researchers first of like software applications coming up that use all of this power because you can, in academia, you can start saying, well, what if I did have infinite compute? Like, what would I do differently? And so you see things like, you know, VR and like advanced gaming come up on the consumer side. And then I think the real, you know, answer on the business side is AI and ML. And I, it, it sort of 
you know, the general trend I start you know, thinking of is something that I was uh, used to talk about um, back, back in the old days, which is this conversion of like having machines work for us instead of us working for machines. And like the only way that we're gonna, ever gonna like get there is by having higher and higher intelligence on, on the application side so that it kind of intuits more based on what it's seen before, what it knows about you, et cetera, in terms right. of the task that needs to get, uh, get done. And then there's like this whole new breed of person that you need in order to like you know wield all of that power because you know like Hadoop, it's not just like natural. Like you don't just have people floating around like, hey, you know, I'm gonna be like a an Uzi expert or a yarn expert. It's like you know I don't, you know, you don't run into people every day. It's like oh yeah, I know you know um, you know neural nets well. I like I'm a gradient descent expert, you know, or whatever you know your right, your right. model is. So it's it's really going to drive like a lots of lots of changes. I think. Right. <laughs> well, hopefully it does, and especially like we were talking about earlier, you know, within core curriculums at schools and stuff. Um, we had Grace Hopper and 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 Brenda Wilkerson, the new head of the Anita Borg organization, was at the Chicago Public School District, and they actually starting to make CS. A requirement, along right. with biology and physics and chemistry and some of these other things. So right. you know, we we do have a huge, a huge dearth of that. But I want to just close out on one last concept before I let you go. And and you guys are way on top of this. Greg talked about what you just talked about, yeah. which is making the computers work for us versus the other way around. And that's really the democratization of the power. Right. And we heard a lot about democratization of big data and the tools. Now you guys are talking about the democratization of the integration, especially when you got a bunch of cloud-based applications that everybody has access to and maybe needs to stitch together a different way. But when you look at the, the just this whole concept of democratization mm -hmm. of that power, how do you see that kind of playing out over the next several years? Yeah, that, that that's a very you know. I'm big, sorry, I didn't bring a couple it's, it's, beers. It's, it's, for it's us a to, very to big. Uh, no, I got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's a it's a very big, interesting question because I think you know, first of all, it's like one of these like unknowns. We we can't predict with a lot of like accuracy how exactly that's going to look because we're sort of juxtaposing two things. One is you know part of the initial move to the cloud was the failure to properly democratize data inside inside the enterprise for whatever reason and you know, we we didn't do it now we have the compute resources and the central you know kind of web based access to everything great now we have you know cambridge analytica and like facebook and people really thinking about like da data privacy and the fact that we we want you know ubiquitous safe access, and I think we know how to make things ubiquitous. The question is, do we know how to make it sort of safe and fair so that the right people are using the right data in the right way? And it's a little bit like, you know, nobody, you know, there's all these like cautionary tales out there, like beware of, you know, AI and robotics and everything. And nobody really thinks about like the danger of this you know, like data that's there, but it's a much more immediate problem and uh, and yet it's sort of like the silent like killer until some scandal right. uh, scandal comes up and then you, and we start thinking about these different ways we can uh, tackle it. Yeah, you know, obviously like there's like you know great you know solutions for tokenization and encryption and everything at the at the data level. But it, even if you have access to it, the question is how you control that that wildfire that could happen as soon as like the the horse leaves the barn. So. You know, it's maybe not in its current form, but when you look at things like blockchain, you know, there's been a lot of predictions about how blockchain can be used around like data. And I think that this, this privacy and this curation and tracking of who you know, has the data, who has access to it, and can we control it, I think you are looking at even more like kind of centralized and guarded access to you know, this, this private data. Right. Interesting times. Yeah, yeah duh, for sure. All right, James, for sure. thanks for taking a couple minutes uh, with us. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, it's, all, it's always great. Uh, thanks for having me, Jeff. All right, <laughs> He's James, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE. We're at the SnapLogic headquarters in San Mateo, California. Thanks for watching.